Steinway Grand Piano. <laughs> and it's a lot different than that. <laughs> Your fingers feel different, you, the keyboard's different, and uh, everything. So, you, and when you, when you swap instruments around a lot like that, you know, it's, it's really different. And when you, especially when you are reduced to playing a keyboard that you can push a button and it changes everything. That's nerve wracking. Anyway, Romans chapter number 10. Good evening. N nice to see Certainly glad to see you tonight. And I know it's been a long day. By the way, you look around. There's a lot of folks aren't here that normally are here. <laughs> Where, where's Russ? Where's John Manasco? It's a fiasco when Manasco he's isn't here. <laughs> he, I don't care if he's on Pal Talk. He's supposed to be here. I can't see him on Pal. How can you abuse a guy if he's not here? <laughs> Years ago, when I first met John when, in this meeting, and I, I was trying to remember his name, I couldn't remember his name. I said it sounds. It, it rhymes with fiasco. <laughs> and I, oh, Manasco, that was it. And, and I miss John. My wife asked me, I said, where, "Where is John?" I said, "I don't know. He's not here." Well, okay, a lot of, uh, and you know, time and chance happen to all of us, and, and we, l circumstances do what they do, and so forth. But, uh, you know, there, there are folks that aren't here. You look around and see somebody that you know that didn't hear, you drop them a note, give them a call, and tell them you missed them, will you? So that they, they know that, uh, that, that, that we did recognize that they weren't here and that we did miss them. And I want you to know I'm glad you're here, and especially those of you that are here the first time. I've met a number of folks here that are here the first for the first time to this meeting. You, you watch our TV program or some of those kind of things. And it's, uh, it's great to be able to meet you in the flesh and see you. And, 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 and I, I don't, I, you know, I look at a camera and I don't see anybody. And uh, you, you see what you see when you're looking at the TV. But uh, whether it's the television, the, the uh, internet, or the other, you know, the other media things, any of the, us guys are happy to be able to meet you in person, and, and we certainly appreciate you being here. I'm gonna, we're going to have a, this is going to be a Bible study tonight. They gave me a topic tonight, and I, I was looking at the clock, and I'm thinking, you know, you guys have been studying all day long, sitting here, and then, then they give me a topic that there's no way to teach it except for it to be a Bible study. And that's okay. That's what we're here for. And uh, you can rest next week, okay? You can sleep in Monday. You can take a nap tomorrow afternoon, but tonight we're going to think just for a few minutes. Romans chapter 10, and the topic is the word of faith, and that comes out of verse number uh, number 8 when he says, But as it, but, uh, but what saith it, the word of, is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, and that is your the word of faith. That's what we're going to talk about. Our Father, we thank you tonight for your word and for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, the fellowship we can have together with one another around your word, and most, uh, most wonderfully with you through it all. And we pray that the things we do tonight might be uh, for the edification of your people and for the encouragement uh, of the saints. And we thank you in Christ's name. Amen. When you, talk, when, you, when you read that phrase, the word of faith, it's important for you to understand that when he's talking about the word, he's talking about the word of God because he just quoted Deuteronomy 30. We'll look at that in a minute. And what we're preaching is the word of faith. Faith, verse, if you look at verse 17, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The word of God is the source of faith. Now that's a fundamental issue you have to understand. Where does faith come from? It comes from God's word. It's simply believing what God's word says. That's what faith is all about, when you trust what God says. Um, and that's true no matter what dispensation you live in, no matter where you are. Faith is the, is the positive persuasion. It's, it, it, you define it in a lot of different ways. It's a positive mental attitude towards sound doctrine. It's in Romans 4, he says about Abraham, he's fully persuaded that he had promised, is able to do it. All kind of definitions of faith. But simply put, it's just trusting. It's just believing what God said. I love the verse in 1 John when it says, He that uh, you, uh, you receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. And here's the witness that God has given us eternal life, and that life is in His Son. The witness of God, if you know how to believe a man, a person, somebody tells you something, well, you know how to believe. The witness of God is greater. 
God won't lie to you. He won't make a mistake. He won't tell you something that isn't true. He'll always be right. You won't do that. All those things are not true about men, but it is true about God. So the witness of God is greater, but faith and the issue is not your faith. The issue is what your faith is in. God has given you a word that is worthy of your trust. That's the idea. Now, there's the old Calvinist idea that the, in order to be saved, God has to give you faith, and He has to regenerate you and give you new life so then you can believe. Now, that's theology. That's not Bible. In the Bi Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. In the Bible, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So you first need to hear the message of God's Word, and when you hear the message of God's Word, that message is a life-giving message. Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. The way the Spirit of God work, work, comes into your heart, the way the life of God's Spirit comes into your heart is through His Word. And when you believe His Word, they are life for you. It becomes the Word of life. Ephesians chapter 1. Here, here's a passage of Scripture that every, if you've never memorized this verse, you need to have it memorized. Ephesians 1 verse 13. Talking about, you see the part, last part of verse 12, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted. After that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. You trusted in Christ, but you trusted in him after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Faith comes by hearing. You hear the gospel of your salvation. What is that? Paul said, I delivered unto you first of all that which you also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scripture, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scripture. So you hear the message of God's Word that Christ died for your sins. You hear from God's Word that you are a sinner, that you need a Savior, that Jesus Christ died for your sins. God commended his love toward you, and that while you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you. You hear that Jesus Christ died for your sins according to the Scripture, not according to church history, not according to what you learned in Sunday school, not according to, 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 to a doctrinal statement, but because, because God said that. It's true because God said it. You're going to trust it because God said it. He was buried and he was raised again the third day according to the Scriptures, all based on God's Word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. So after you heard that message, would it convict you to know that you're a sinner? The Word of God will do that. You know, you get convicted about being a sinner. So you, pe people are, you know, you, you know the, the sorrow of the world. I'm sorry I got caught. <laughs> but the sorrow that the Word of God convicts you of is that you're a sinner. David, after he had after he'd committed adultery with a man's wife, stole his wife, then had him murdered to cover it up, and lost the baby that came from all of that. After all of that, Nathan the prophet came and put his nose, finger in his face and said, You are the man, the sinner. And David said, I have sinned. He recognized it. He got convicted of it. And then he wrote Psalm 51 where he said, Against thee and thee only, O God, have I sinned. Now he committed adultery against a woman, murdered her husband, had the baby killed as a result of all, died as a result of all that, and yet in face of all that, he said, God, in compared, to all, compared to you, all, all of that, against thee and thee only have I sinned. He, re he recognized the magnitude of that. By the way, in Psalm 51, he calls the conviction of that as like blood guiltiness. He calls it in Psalm, he, he calls it the, as the breaking of bones. <laughs> you ever get that miserable over your sin? That's what conviction is. How does that come? It comes because God's Word convicts you that you're a sinner. And then it tells you that, hey, the good news, Christ died for your sins. God commended his love towards you. And that while you're yet a sinner, you weren't trying to fix it. You weren't trying to make it better. You weren't trying to get, 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 get over it. You are going on in it in your mind with enemy, a, enemies and alienated from God in your mind with wicked works. Christ died for you. He died for your sins. He paid for other things wrong with you. And then God raised him to demonstrate that the death payment was enough and that there's life for you. And when you heard that, after you heard that, you trusted him. I mean, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you trust him after you heard that? What is it would keep you from trusting him? It never loved you like that. It'll never save you. It'll never die for you. I mean, you hear that kind of... You see, that's the difference between religion. I can understand why somebody won't relig wouldn't want religion. But I, you, you, you hear that and you say, wow... Why wouldn't you trust that? 
People say the world's dying for lack of love. No, the world's dying in spite of the greatest love anybody could ever know. After you heard, in whom you, you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth. See, faith comes by hearing. After you hear the word, then you trust him. You don't get saved without, hear, without the gospel. That's important for you to understand. Also, in whom also, after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So there's the order. You hear, you believe, then God the Holy Spirit seals you. The moment you trust Jesus Christ, God the Holy Spirit, that instant, faster than I can map my fingers, does five things for every believer, every person. He circumcises you. He, it's C-R-I-B-S, cribs. That's where you put a baby. He circumcises you. He regenerates you. He indwells you. He baptizes you. And he seals you. Instantaneously, the moment you trust God, you don't feel it. You don't sense it. You didn't know about it if you didn't read about it in the Word of God. But it's still as real as, if, as, as anything there is. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word. It's the Word of faith. That's where salvation comes from. That's where life comes from. So the Word of faith is the source of our, of our faith. You know, it's a, it's, it's a book you can trust. That's the point. I said last night, you better have a Bible you know you can trust. I've told people for decades, you need to trust the Bible you're reading until it tells you you can't. Whatever Bible you have, trust it until you, it tells you you can't trust it. If you've got a Bible in Mark chapter 1, verse 2 that says, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet and it quotes Malachi, you know you can't trust that Bible completely. Why? It just made a mistake. Eh, boner. If, it's, if it says it's written in Isaiah and, it's, and, and you look it up and it's in Malachi, what's that? That's, a mis that's called a mistake. Either Isaiah is incomplete or, or Mark 1, 2 is wrong. If you use a Bible that says that, you cannot believe in biblical infallibility. I don't care what your doctrinal statement says. you got people running around with doctrinal statements that we believe in biblical infallibility and they got a Bible that's got a mistake in it. Listen, you can blow smoke all you want to, but sooner or later, somebody's going to read that and realize, hey, you're telling me, you're, 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 well, you're selling me a bill of goods. You ever done that? Now, you can have a Bible that doesn't have the mistake in it, because if you've got a King James Bible, it doesn't have the mistake in it. I'm not talking about, I would prefer it to be translated a different way. I'm just talking about a factual mistake. I mentioned the one last night about the new Bible saying that Elhana killed Goliath. My six-year-old grandson knows better than that and has known better than that since he was three years old. Okay? So if you've got a Bible that tells you that in Samuel that Elhana killed Goliath, that's a factual mistake. I'm not talking about, well, I would prefer it to be translated another way because it helps my doctrine out. I'm just talking about facts. And you can, you know, you can go on and on and on with those kind of things. A young man told me the other day, he, he, he brought me a, a book written by a seminary professor that's all about all the mistakes in the King James Bible. And uh, silly stuff. But what people do is they don't check it out. For years, people have told me, Brother Rick, you believe in the mistakes in the King James Bible? And I've had a standard answer. I've never seen one. If you know one, show me, and I'll look, it up. I'll look at it. And I've, I, used to have, I used to go to meetings, and people say, well, here's a mistake. And I probably had 150, 180 different mistakes people showed me. And you know what I'd, I would go home and discover? It wasn't a problem with the Bible. It was a problem with the people that, 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 are, that are talking. About 80% of the time, they didn't know enough about their language to know what it was. You shouldn't be mad at your Bible if, it, if, it, if, if the translators of your Bible knew more about your language than you do. Don't be mad at them. Be mad at your fifth grade teacher. Yeah. The mistakes that people make, th this guy's book, uh, one of the big ones, in 1 Timothy 2, 9, when it talks about shamefacedness, he said it should be shame fastness. Go home and look up those two words in the dictionary, and you know what you'll find out? They're synonyms. Webster's Dictionary tells you they are. That's a problem. 
I'm going to throw my Bible out because of a thing like that. But he says, everybody knows. And you know what you find out? They really don't everybody know. Verse back in Genesis 36 when he talks about, uh, he, he went over here to the place where the mules are and he, uh, the new Bible, some of the new Bible said, we went over here to the place where the running water and you say mules, running water, what is that? How can that be? Everybody knows it ought to be the other. You look it up. You find out about two-thirds of the people say mules and about a third of the others say running water. And you say, hmm, what's he talking? He's so confident. And I, and I always say, that was, your, that was your verse? I mean, I'm hanging Mark 1, 2 on you and hanging Goliath on you and you're doing this? I mean, that's, you know, I just scratched my head about that. I don't get it. But what I was, gonna, what I was getting at, I did, that, was an, that was my rabbit trail. My wife says I can have one a message. I've already burned it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's why you, I'm going to shoot ducks in the pond instead of in the air. <laughs> the, uh, the, 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 the young boy, young man, about late 20s, got a family, loves the Lord. His dad, good guy, loves the Lord, gave that book to his son, said, here, I want you to, he's trying to get him out of our church. He says, I want you to see that there are mistakes in the, in the King James Bible. And the young boy, he, he brought it to him. He says, what do you think about this? He'd read it. He said, I've read through it. And I've looked at it. And I figured out that most of this stuff in this book's nonsense, but I've got a couple of things let's talk about. And we talked about them, and, and he figured them out. And I told him, I said, now, I'm going to tell you something. You need to love your dad, but don't you ever do to your, your son, your little boy, what your dad's doing to you. Don't you ever try to talk your son into believing the Bible's got mistakes in it. Can you imagine how sad it is for a dad to have a passion to teach his child that the Bible has got errors in it? I'd spend my time telling them it didn't, frankly, even if I thought it did, because I'd want them to trust it. The Word of Faith is a book you can trust implicitly. And you've been given the privilege in your, in your, in your situation to have in your hands in a King James Bible a book you can trust 100% of the time. Another thing I, I was thinking while Des was preaching, wouldn't it be sad to tell people that Christ didn't die for everybody? How sad it would be to be a preacher to go out and say, Jesus didn't die for everybody. <laughs> and I think, man, and you know there are people that do that and make good money doing it and are famous on the radio and the television doing it. And I think, well, how sad that is. The Word of Faith, it's a book that can produce faith in your heart because you can trust it. Now, if you look back at verse number 6, I, I want to spend just a little time trying to go through the text here so that you can understand what he's saying. Look back at verse number uh, 5. For Moses, he's going to make a contrast. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law. That the man that doeth those things shall live by them. The law is a performance system where you have to perform to get acceptance. So under the law, if you do the things the law requires, you can have life. If you don't, you get cursed. That's why by the law is the knowledge of sin, and by the law no man will ever be justified, because you can't do the things of the law. I mean, somebody said there's 613 commandments in the law. You don't need that many. There are 10 simple ones that you can't do. So the problem with the law is, is not that the law is bad. The law is good. The law is a representative of the mind of God. The problem is it's weak through your flesh. Okay. So the righteousness of the law says do it and live, and your problem is you can't. So here's the righteousness, which is of faith. Verse 6, speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? Now the parenthesis, that is to bring Christ down from above. He's quoting Deuteronomy chapter number 30, verse 14. Now that's really the reference. I'm not going to be like Des and tell you to get your own. 
the parenthesis is the interpretation. The parenthesis isn't in Deuteronomy. When he says, Deuteronomy says, who shall ascend into heaven, that is, here's the interpret. here's what that's a reference to. Here's how that passage was fulfilled. That is to bring Christ down from above. In other words, Jesus fulfilled that verse. Oh, who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. So what he's doing is he's saying, look, Christ has fulfilled that passage. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. Now that's still a quote from Deuteronomy. Now he's going to quit quoting Deuteronomy, and he's going to say, that is the word of faith which we preach. The word of faith which we preach is that Jesus Christ fulfilled what the promises of, of the law were, what Moses promised was coming in a Redeemer, Jesus Christ fulfills. And since the Word of God promised the Lord Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ has fulfilled what, 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 what the Word of God promised, Paul says, that's the word of faith which we preach. We're preaching, Paul says, that Jesus Christ fulfilled the promises. Now, by the way, when he says, which we preach, Des is mentioning this whole passage, 9, 10, and 11, is a passage about the nation Israel. Well, did, did Israel preach this? The little flock did. Did Paul preach it? Yes, he did. We all preach that Jesus Christ fulfilled these things in, in, in Israel's program. That's why he says in verse 9, that is... That, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It's a fascinating thing when you read that passage, that <laughs> it does mention people use that. You know, you see tracts with that written on it. Verse number 10 is, is terribly confusing to people. Uh, if I should believe with thine, confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead. That's the verse people used to try to get you down the aisle. For with the, mouth, with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. What's that called? That's justification. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. In that verse, you believe with your heart and get justified. You confess with your mouth and you get salvation. In that verse, salvation is something different than justification. See that? Your heart gets one, your mouth gets the other. Now, when he says your heart, he's not talking about your blood pump. Okay? So when he says your mouth, he might not be talking about your lips. But he's talking about two different things. He's talking about justification, being declared righteous before God based upon your faith in God's Word, and then a confession of that unto salvation, which is different from justification. In Israel's program, you have to be very careful. People argue about, well, are people under the, how are people saved under the law? Saved from what? You always ask that question. You see, we say, by grace you are saved through faith. That not of yourself is a gift of God. Saved from what? Well, that would be saved into eternal life, saved from death and hell, so forth. But in Israel's program, a lot of times, in Acts chapter, can you save yourself? Well, Acts 2.40 says you can. You ever read Acts 2.40? You don't read Acts 2 at all, do you? Well, that's good. <laughs> Acts 2.38, he says, oh, well, look at it. This is where this right division gets real, <laughs> real important for you. Acts 2.38, Peter's talking to the leaders of Israel. He says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children, and as many as are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he exhort, did testify and exhort them, saying, Save yourselves. Well, how about that? That's a kick in the seat of the pants, isn't it? 
I hear people quote Acts 2.38 on the radio, you know, I'm trying to get you to get baptized, get, but, but, get, you know, repent and be baptized so you can get your sins forgiven, get the gift of the Holy Ghost, and all that kind of stuff. And they don't ever read verse 40. But notice what verse 40 said, save yourselves from. This untoward generation, that's that apostate generation in Israel that was untoward the things of God. How are they going to do that? They're going to be separated from that. That's, the, you, that's what the baptism of repentance for the mission of sins is all about, is to separate that believing remnant out. The issue in salvation in the Bible has to be determined by where you are. That's why Romans 10, the salvation in Romans 10, is that salvation right there. With the heart man believes, with the mouth confession is made into salvation. In Israel's program, salvation was a bigger thing than justification. They needed more than individual justification. They had that national issue going on there. Go back with me to Romans and just chapter 9. Just what Paul's explaining here in Romans 9 and 10 is why did Israel, why didn't they believe in the Lord Jesus when he came? Now when you come to Romans 9, you come out of Romans 8. Boy, do you like Romans 8? <laughs> Woo! How do you get much better than Romans 8? You get there and you say, wow. And he, and he ends the thing up in verse, verse 30, 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, peril, sword, as it is written, for thy sake we killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, and all these things were more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor heights, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Woo! You can't wait to what he's got to tell you next, can you? Well, that next verse is going to be a doozy. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I may that I have great heaviness and, and continuous sorrow in my heart, for, for I could wish myself to be a curse from Christ. Whoa, wait a minute. For my kinsmen, my brethren, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the, wit, the adoption and the glory and the covenant, the covenants, and, and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, who is the fathers, uh, whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all God blessed forever, amen. You can't read that and not know that this was a change of gears. I mean, you strip your gears thinking those two things are the same. Obviously, he's changed the topic and he's moved from, from the body of Christ and how God's equipped us on planet earth to live for his glory. And now he's going to focus on the nation Israel and Israel's got a problem. And he said, I could wish myself a curse from Christ for my kinsmen. They're in trouble. Well, what's the problem with Israel? Well, he's going to ask you some, he's going to offer some problems, some suggestions. Verse 6. Not as though the word of God had, not ta had taken none effect. Is the problem with Israel that God's word didn't work? Well, no. Why? He says, look. Look at Israel. There was Abraham. What did Abraham do? He had Isaac. What did Isaac do? He had Jacob. It worked. It called out a, it called out a seed line. The seed's there. So obviously the word of God worked. The purpose of God according to election, it worked. So you've got Abraham, Isaac. You understand when, when the Bible talks about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it's, it's, it's saying Abraham, Isaac, not Ishmael. Jacob, not Esau. That's the reason it says the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because it was Abraham, God chose Abraham. He has Isaac, but he had Ishmael first. And he said, that's not the seed. This is the seed. Then he, he has Jacob has, uh, Isaac has Jacob and Esau, the twin boys in the mother's womb. And, and, and the prophecy is the elder shall serve the younger. It's going to be Jacob, not Esau. So there is a choosing. And the purpose of God according to election, what his word said, you know what? It worked. So the problem isn't with the word of God. Well, then verse number 14. What shall we say then? Well, if that's not the problem, is, it, is there unrighteousness with God? Well, if the Word of God worked, then is there something wrong with God? Is He unrighteous? 
Well, you see the answer there, don't you? God forbid. What kind of nut would say that? And he gives you an explanation about the thing with Pharaoh. You know what God did? With, God does, does with Israel. He has a principle that he deals with the nation Israel. I, I call it the, the, the delay principle. I don't know any other way to say it. He says, I raised up Pharaoh to make my name great. But, but when he did that, what did he tell Moses? He said, go down there and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Go down there and tell my people, I'm, gonna let you, I'm, I'm taking you out. So Moses goes down and says, let my people go. Get ready, folks, we're leaving. And then the Lord says to Moses, to Pharaoh, Moses he says, now, wait just a minute. Before you go, I'm going to whack that guy a couple of times. I'm going to show everybody what it is when I deliver my people how I'm going to destroy the Gentiles. He sent ten plagues on that guy. If I was an Israeli and I said, Moses, I thought you said we were leaving. You get a little impatient. My watch is even gone. You get a little, you get a little impatient. I want to see. Be patient. I'm, we're going to go. But I've got something else to do first. You follow that? Three times in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ he did that. He's on the way to heal this, guy, this guy's kid. A woman touches him and he stops. And he says, who touched me? Remember that? And while he's healing her, what happened to the little... To the, they died. Wow. He heard Lazarus. He's sick. And he delayed on purpose. While he was delaying, Lazarus died. You know why? He had, he had, something, he had something bigger to do. He's got this delay principle. That's what Paul talks about. He says... He, he said, "Go raise it. I'm going to get you out, but I've got to do this first. So the problem wasn't, wasn't God being unrighteous. It's God's got a plan. And it's, the, it's not of him that willeth or him that runneth, but it's God. Listen, when God sets up the plan, that's his business, how he set it up. He's God. So you come to verse number 19. You've got another question. If it isn't that God's unrighteousness, unrighteous, th th then shall we say then, will thou say then, then unto me? Is that word then? He's making an argument and progressing with it. Will thou say then unto me, why does he yet find fault? For who can resist his will? Well, look, if, if it's him that willeth and him that runneth, but God, not of him that willeth or him that runneth, but God that that. that, that sets the thing out, then who can resist his will? If he's going to do it and do what he wants to do, no matter what, who can resist him? So it's really his fault anyway, isn't it? And he says, well, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm paraphrasing the argument just to get it over with. He says, you guys remember going down to the potter's house? You remember when I sent Jeremiah down to the potter's house? And I said, Jerry, God says, Jerry, go down to the potter's house and watch the potter working on the wheel and watch what he does. And Jerry goes down and he sees the potter. Jer Jeremiah 18. He sees the potter and the potter's working the wheel, molding a piece of clay, and he's making a pot. And it says it was he was making it and it was marred in his hands. And what did he do? He squished it all back down and he made another one. That's a reshaping principle. He had that potter, that, pot, that clay, and God tells him, Jeremiah 18, he says, if I take that, isn't that potter, isn't that clay, it's in the potter's hands, and it's in the power, the, the potter can make it any way he wants to. And he starts making it, and it gets marred, and he can squish it down and make it something else if he wants to. He says to him in Jeremiah 18, he says, if I tell you I'm going to do something, I'm going to make you a king. I'm going to build you a kingdom, and you won't have it, and you rebel against it. You know what? I can reshape you. And he says to them, "You know what? God had these vessels of honor, and they wouldn't respond. And you know what He did? He squished them back down, and made them into vessels of dishonor. He set Israel aside. Why? Because of their unbelief." 
And that wasn't God being unrighteous. That wasn't, that wasn't, God's, that wasn't somebody saying, well, who can resist this? Well, God, you ever read those verses in, in Genesis where it says God repented that he made man? That tells you repentance doesn't mean be sorry for your sin. How would God be sorry for sin? People write me letters and say, don't you believe in repentance, Brother Rick? I said, yeah, I sure do. Had a, guy, right, had a guy on Facebook the other day, he says, what should you do when believers sin? It's just one simple word. Stop! <laughs> the grace of God teaches you that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteous, and godly. Don't live in that stuff you used to be. Live in who you, do, who you are now. I mean, I don't know why that takes a lot of discussion. That's just kind of, to me, that's just so simple, it's just kind of dumb to ask the question twice. Repentance in the Bible is not turning from your sin. You know, Billy used to say, I say used to because he doesn't say much anymore, but uh, he, he used to say, it means to be sorry for your sin. How sorry? Real sorry. Preach that. I mean, turn from your then how in the world did God repent? You see, repentance simply means to change your mind, a change of mind that produces a change of direction. But it comes from the change of mind. In Thessalonians, he says, you turn to God from idols. You know what that is? That is repentance in action. Faith, you turn from unbelief to belief. That's repentance. You don't always have to call it something to be that. You don't have to describe it to, to have it. Well, what God's saying is that, and now when it says God changed his mind, who changed his mind? We say God did. But why? He didn't change his mind in what he's doing. He changed his mind in doing it with you because you wouldn't cooperate with what he's doing, and I'm not going to change my mind what I'm doing, and you're going to go that way. Well, I'm not going that way with you. I'm going here. And the repentance, the change in God's mind, doesn't come because God vacillates. It's because of the change in the circumstances. And God tells Jeremiah, he says, listen, when the circumstances change, I'm still going to do what I'm going to do, even if you change in relationship to it. So the problem isn't with Israel that God is somehow unfair with them. So what's the problem? Verse 30. What should we say then? Well, here's what we say. Here's the conclusion. The Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness. Even the righteousness, which is of faith. You know what happened? God took Israel and reshaped them into vessels of dishonor. Why? Because of their unbelief. And then he took some vessels of dishonor and shaped them into vessels of mercy. Right there. That's talking about the fact that God changed the dispensational structure that was there in Israel's program. Okay? So what do we say? The Gentiles, which are down here in unbelief, verse 30, which followed not after righteousness. They, they weren't trying to be righteous. They weren't trying to do anything God gave them. God didn't give them anything to do. They're going on in their own, in, their own, in their own ignorance. The time of this ignorance God winked at. They were going on in their own way. But they've attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock and rock of offense. Whosoever believeth in him shall not be ashamed. The point there is that when Jesus Christ came, he's the rock, the stone. When he came, instead of Israel, he, came, he said, I'm the word of God. John 5, he said, search the scripture, for they are they that testify of me. 
if you had believed what Moses wrote, you would have believed me because I'm the one Moses wrote about. So if Israel had been believing God's word all along here, when the living word of God showed up, what would they have done? They'd have believed him. Why? Because they were believing God's word. What's the problem? When the word, the living word of God showed up, they didn't believe him. Why? Because they weren't believing God's word anyway. So why would they believe the living word when he showed up when they weren't in the mood to believe the word of God, period? Now, why were they in that condition? Verse chapter 10. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and watch, going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. So rather than believing God's word, learning from God's word, what God's word was designed to teach them, what would the law have taught them if they learned what the schoolmaster was to teach them? that you can't do it. David learned that. Go back and read Psalm 51. David figured out, after all the screw-up he made of his life, he figured out that the law wasn't going to help him. And he says, sacrifice and offerings thou wouldst not. They won't do a bit of good. A broken and contrite heart. That's what you want. See, he, he learned what the law was designed to teach him. The law is the knowledge of sin. You can't do it. <laughs> so what do you need? You need a Savior. What did God promise Israel all along? That's why Galatians 3 says the law, which is added to the promise, couldn't disannul the promise. Because, see, when you get in that conundrum, and that people do that, they say, how were people saved back in the Old Testament? And then they get into the conundrum, you've got, you got to keep the law, but they can't keep the law, but you've got to keep the law, but they can't keep the law. Well, if you can't keep the law, you can't... He says, hey, wait a minute. Remember, he added, the law was added to, to get you into that confused con conundrum because it couldn't give you life anyway, but it didn't disannul the promise. <laughs> God had promised Abraham something. When somebody makes a promise to you, what do you do? What can you do? You just sit down and believe it and wait for them to fulfill it. You follow that? So what did they, that's what David learned. He said, oh, it isn't me, it's, he's going to do it. Because who's going to be Israel's redeemer? Them or him? He is. Who's going to be their blesser? Them or him? He is. Who's going to be their king? Them or him? He is. Who's going to be their deliverer? Them or him? He is. All the things that they need, he's going to do for them. They thought we could do it. They went about to establish their own righteousness. You know what that's called? Religion. Let me show you. Isaiah 53. I'm sorry, 58. Isaiah 58. And I'm going over this because, listen, all this stuff with Israel back here, doing all this stuff, let me tell you, the flesh that caused them to do it hangs on you. They were the sons of Adam, just like you are, and the things that caused them to do what they did in this regard, caught you and I find our, we have that same kind of religious flesh in us. That same desire to do it ourselves. That same desire to go about and establish our own righteousness. And what you see God do with the nation Israel is an example to you and me of what happens with religion. Isaiah 58, cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression, and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily, and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness, and forsook not the ordinances of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice, they take delight in approaching to God. What did they take delight in? Wouldn't it have been better if they took delight in finding him? 
You see, they were delighting in their religion, in all the things they're doing to approach Him. They act like they haven't forsaken. Listen, here's the nation Israel fixing to be carried off into Babylonian captivity because of their apostasy and their sin, acting like they hadn't done anything wrong. We've got our religion. They had so corrupted that religion, they were worshiping the Queen of Heaven. They were, they were completely in the grip of satanic rebellion. There's a set of tapes back there called Satan's Church. If you don't know what the Queen of Heaven is, she got a church in Chicago right up not, not too far from where we used to meet. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Got all kind of people right around here think she's the greatest thing since sliced bread. Worshiping the Queen of Heaven. Jeremiah 44, 700 years before Jesus Christ, the nation of Israel was captured by her. People say, whew, our religion is the oldest religion. Yeah, about 700 years before Christ, that old. That's pretty old. Actually, it goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 11. Still ex I'm saying it still exists today. Verse 3, wherefore we have fasted. Have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and taken no, thou hast taken no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fasting, God says, now he's responding, ye find pleasure and extract all your labors. You see, they weren't finding pleasure in the Lord. They were finding pleasure in seeking the Lord and, 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 and doing all this religious stuff. They were going about to establish their own righteousness and having a good time doing it. Thank you. Religion is designed to satisfy the lust of your flesh. And they were using it for that purpose. Rather than believing God's word, they were going about to establish their own righteousness. Now, Romans 10, 4. Well, the problem is that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. So what did Israel need to do? Not trust their own righteousness but believed God's word that said they needed to repent, change their mind about their ability, recognize their need for the, for the Redeemer, recognize Jesus Christ as the re Redeemer, trust Him, do what He said to do. The baptism of repentance for the mission of sins was designed, Ezekiel 36, uh, 25 says, he, that I will sprinkle you with clean water and I will cleanse you from your filthiness and follow all of your idols will I cleanse you. Separate them away from the apostate religion out there and make that little flock. Then he's going to put his spirit on them and make them the nation that's going to, going to uh, inherit the kingdom. But that came about because they believed God's word to them. They didn't get it because the nation didn't do that. The nation had its religion. And its religion crucified the Messiah and then blasphemed the Holy Spirit. So Paul said the reason Israel fell, the reason they got in this mess and that they, that, that they were concluded in unbelief, verse 30 in chapter 11, he says he concluded them in unbelief. And that unbelief is what caused their fall. Now you go back to chapter 10, verse number Five, for Moses describeth the righteousness which is the law. But the man that doeth those things shall live by them. If you're going to establish your own, your own righteousness, you've got to keep them. How many you got to keep? All of them. People ask me, say, Brother Jordan, you don't think you should keep the Ten Commandments? Sure you should. Duh, how dumb can that be? The question isn't should you keep them, the question is how are you doing keeping them? Galatians 3.10, quoting the book of Deuteronomy, he says you've got to keep them all. Every one of them. James 2 says if you, you keep them all and offend in one point, you're guilty of all. You're in trouble. You say, well, I'll, I'll keep them all from now on. Well, what about your past? Be like the hounds of hell after you. you you'll never get away. Your performance won't get it. But the righteousness which is of faith. See, what they were saying is verse 5. What they should have said was verse 6. The righteousness which is of faith saith on this wise, Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven, 
That is to bring Christ down. If they had had faith, they would have seen that Jesus Christ was the one that Moses promised. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring uh, up Christ from the dead. But it's but what saith it? What does the word of faith say? The word of faith, the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That's why verse number 9 and 10 talk about the mouth and the heart. It's because Deuteronomy 30 is talking about what's, in the, what's to be in their mouth and what's to be in their heart. Their belief in their heart was to produce some activity with their mouth, but it had to start in their heart. And without the faith in the heart, the activity didn't make any difference. The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth, the word of faith which we preach in thy heart, the wor that is the word of faith which we preach. And by the way, the we preach there, that's 1 Corinthians 15 verse 11 where Paul says that whether it be they or, 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 or us, we preach what? That Christ is risen. We preach that Jesus Christ is the one that God said was going to die and be the scripture said was going to die and be raised again. We, we all agree, both programs agree that Jesus Christ is the Messiah who died on the cross and was resurrected. Faith always knows that. You know that. I know that. They knew it. So what does the word of faith do? The word of faith believes God's word. That's why verse 10, 9, he says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth and believe in thy, uh, with, with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and that's what they had to do. They had to acknowledge him as their Messiah and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead. That's the two great issues that Israel faced in the book of Acts and they'll face in the future. He's the Messiah and God raised him from the dead. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You see that issue of the word of faith. You believe God's word, and when you believe God's word, it does the work. It releases the power of the Spirit of God to accomplish in your life what God intends to accomplish. It would have done that with Israel had they believed it. It will do that with you if you believe it. Look with me at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's get two passages real quick. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and uh, Philemon. 1 Thessalonians 2 and the book of Philemon. When you've got a book, you've got, a tr you've got the word. And I say again, you can't believe it if you don't have it. But when you've got God's word, and God's word to you, and you understand who you are and what God has said to you, your faith, resting in an understanding of God's word to you, is what allows the Spirit of God, enable, empowers the Spirit of God to take the exceeding greatness of the power of the, of the word of God and put it into action into your life. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you heard the word of truth, uh, sorry, you, heard the, you received the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh in you that believe. You see where God's word works? It works in you that believe. It comes into your spirit. Words that I speak unto you, they are spirit in their life. You have a part of your internal anatomy as a human. You have a spirit, a soul, and a body. I got that teaching tape back there that goes through all this stuff in detail. You have a spirit. The Word of God comes into your spirit. As a believer, you have a living spirit. can receive God's Word. Your heart, your spirit has a mind. Your soul has a mind. That's, where the, that's the connection between your spirit and your soul. 
your heart, with the heart man believes. Remember the verse we read? So your heart believes that word, transfers it into your spirit, into, out of your spirit into your soul. Now the power of that word comes into your inner man, where your, that, your soul is a part of you that's you, where your mind, your will, and your emotions are, and it comes into your mind, your, your, your will believes it, says it's true, and it becomes energizing, it becomes life to you, and it goes up into your emotions, and your, emotion, your, your soul has emotions and your body has emotions, and that's the connection between your soul and your body. And it flows out through your emotions. The word emotion, if you take the word E off of it, what do you have? Motion. They are they're the part of your, your spiritual, your inner man anatomy and your physical anatomy that's designed to, to, to motivate from inside your outward activity. Now what happens when you go... You know, most people say, they don't say spirit, soul, and body like First Thessalonians says. They say body, soul, and spirit. But that's James 5. That's the devil. That's the, 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 the world, flesh, and the devil way of doing it. Because they want to start with your emotions and come in to your soul through that emotion gate. Your emotions are designed to be responders, but they want to take over and they want to go in and, 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 and overcome your mind and make your mind think they're what's real, not, what God, not God's Word. Your mind thinks they're real and now your will is completely paralyzed. And that's why you look at something. Brother Frum and I were eating lunch the other day. I'm going to tell on you. She already knows. And we were eating lunch, and he has to be kind of careful with his diet. And he kept looking over at the dessert ice box. And there was some, they kept filling that thing up. And it was, my back was to it. And I'm watching Merlin watch that thing. And he, keep, he said, boy, there's some good looking things over there. <laughs> and I, he just, he fell a lusting after that, that dessert stuff. And it was, <laughs> and pretty soon, Brother Mark, he, he said, you know, they're going to bring them around here on a tray a little while and show them to us. And sure enough, they did. And Merlin had been, we'd been singing, yield not to temptation, for yielding is sin. Each victory will help you, some other to win. Because when we get home, we're going to tell Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> and and he, he, he bucked up. They brought that thing around in front of him. And he looked at it. And the girl went on. He said, well, well wait, wait just a minute. Come back. He said, let me just look at it again. <laughs> And he looked at it, and he got, okay, that's good. Go. <laughs> and she took off, and, 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 and he did good. <laughs> but you see, what happens is the emotions, and they come, and when, when you let your life come from that way, and that appetite, and it overcomes your mind, and then it paralyzes your will. Fortunately, he had somebody say, you got to go home. You're going to have to face the wife. That's not what you... Coming this way. You, you follow what I'm saying? The Word of God works effectually when you believe it. Here's the Word. It comes in. It's the power of God. The Spirit of God's going to work. The exceeding power of His Spirit working through His Word comes into your spirit. Your, mind, your, your, your faith believes it. And when your faith believes it, it says it works effectually in you that believe. Your emotions respond to what you... And you know that. You go through things all the time. You watch a movie. You know... My favorite illustration of that is, is how many of you ever watch The Affair to Remember? See, all you ladies know it. <laughs> and at the end, when she's laying on the couch and he comes in, he sees the thing and he realizes what it is. You're... <laughs> <laughs> because you can't help but cry. It's just it's that tear-jerking moment a chick flick <laughs> and my wife will see that thing two dozen times 
and then she's bawling. Every now, time. I'm sorry? Every time. Every time. <laughs> and, and now, you know, I'm a guy. And I look at her and say, it's just a movie. <laughs> and she'll say, but it's so dead. <laughs> now, you know it's not real. Real men, okay. Men, real men cry. <laughs> but you know it's not real. But your emotions don't know it's not real. Because your mind has acted like it is. Your will has allowed it to be that way. And your emotions respond to that. Now, that's a silly illustration. But that's way... It's the, your, your emotions are designed to be responders and motivate activity in your, the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith to put the life of Christ on display. Now that's the way you're designed to operate, spirit, soul, and body. Emotional revolt comes the other way. God's word. I take his word, I believe it. It causes it to become energy in my inner man. It becomes the reality. And then the motivation comes. Now what happens when you get your emotions so screwed up that, they w that they're, they're used to being in charge, they won't go away quietly. Merlin's still lusting after that big old piece of, apple, uh, <laughs> piece of chocolate cake. Yeah, see? He, all you got to do is remember it and go, hmm. You, you know, and I was pretty interested in the piece of cream pie right next to it. <laughs> I was too embarrassed to eat one if he didn't eat his, and I wasn't going to help him get in trouble. <laughs> Look with me at Philemon. Verse number six. Paul's praying for Philemon and the saints there. And he says, he's praying that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. The communication of his faith. How is my faith going to become effectual? Well, the word is going to work effectually in me if I believe. Another way of saying that is by my acknowledging of every good thing that is in me in Christ Jesus. You see, when I focus on who God has made me in Christ, and I acknowledge what he said, who he says I am, what he says is true of me. Even when I don't see it in my circumstances, I don't see it in my performance, I don't even see it inside when I look around. But I realize it's what he says. My faith resting in his word about who I am is what makes my faith communicable, powerful, working. That's got nothing to do with a bunch of rules and regulations. It's got to do with life in Christ Jesus. That's why getting in that book, understanding who God, has said, God says you are, and resting in that understanding, and then learning to take that and put it into, a, in, in, in that, into practice in the details of your life. That's the key. That's where the power of God is in your life. And if you want the excellency, the power of God's Spirit to work in your life, it'll be through His Word being trusted, being understood. Being, that's why you have to have an understanding of it. <coughs> that you may know what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. The will of God is good. It's a treasure, folks. It's a precious thing to know what God's will is. It's acceptable. It's when you realize it's really enough. 
It's perfect. It's what will make you a full, complete person. We seek purpose, meaning, validation, acceptance, forgiveness, love. We seek, we seek to be happy, to be fulfilled. When Adam sinned, there was a place in him and his spirit where God lived that went away. And it left a vacuum, a hole. When you get saved, God comes back in. And he says, now I want you to see how I fill that hole. But if you act like he didn't fill it, you don't, you don't, you, it doesn't get in there. It doesn't get operative. And you start looking for love, for acceptance, for forgiveness, unconditional, for validation, for purpose, for meaning, in a thousand places that are much, that are infinitesimally smaller than Jesus is when he's really the only answer. The word of faith says he's enough. He's everything. And it trusts him because the book says it. And when circumstances, the CNS gang come along, you know who the CNS gang, circumstances and situations in life, you got them, you know about them. You talk about a gang problem, there's a gang problem. And when they come along, and they say, it ain't so, McGee. You say, that book says it is. So it is. When every fiber of your being wants to do something, wants to, to go over there, wants to say that's, and the book says this is what's true, you say, this is what's true. I don't care, I don't care anything. This is what's true. And there are going to be times in your life like that. That word of faith. Be with joy and hope. The God of peace, the God of hope, fill you with all joy and peace in believing. I encourage you to trust God's word. And I tell you that when you do, it'll work effectually in you because you believe it. That's why you want to rightly divide the word. Right division at... Don't do it so you can be different from somebody else. Do it so you can get in touch with who God's made you and have that live in your life for his glory. <coughs> Father, we thank you tonight for the day we've had, the opportunity for the edification and encouragement, the fellowship. In Christ's name, amen. Have a good evening. We'll see you in the morning.